on today's bait time banter we're going to be talking about washing lines and we've got two stories around about a hundred years apart yeah washing lines one in victorian bake-up where somebody died on a washing line we can't laugh at that or make light of it because it's a very serious subject and the second we're going back to 1980s in goodshire and we're going to talk about the shroud of goodshire what's that Now my mum was extremely hard working and she was excessively house proud and I mean really to the nth degree but sadly she kind of as we would say in Lancashire took her up in 1982 and left me and father alone so there I was a delicate young child of 18 left with his father. <clears throat> now my mum as I said were really really house proud we had like rugs that you weren't allowed to walk on and woe betide anybody that left a cup ring when I came home from the pit because we had no baths I used to have to strip outside <laughs> never mind that there were neighbours behind watching and then I'd have to run in uh, and jump in the bath so when my mum left me and my father we must have had deep psychological problems caused by this <laughs> because we were like uncoiled springs and I stopped getting stripped outside in the porch and I first ventured in the house and stripped at the door and then after a couple of days you were going up the stairs into the living room because we lived in an upside down house the living room was upstairs the bedrooms downstairs up goodshire you see uh, and then before long you were sat on the settee in your pit clothes so you can imagine that we let the house go a little bit me and father like i said we were like uncoiled springs and uh, i had this new girlfriend and the first time I brought her home, it wasn't a case that we hoovered up with a Dyson to get it clean. We were sort of clearing out with a number 10 coiling shovel, you know. Any road up, there came a point that at least one of us had to consider doing some pretty serious housework, which included doing the washing. Now, we got reminded today about my grandma and granddad's wash tub. Uh, they, I'm sure theirs was a hot point. It was a picture of a hoover I saw today. Uh, but it was a, like a hot point single tub with a mangle on. <clears throat> this is when I was growing up in the 70s. So it shows how long white goods used to last back then. Well, they were cream goods, not white goods then. And they had a mangle on it. And they had a big pair, like a big pair of these wooden tongs that they used to get the clothes in and out of the boiling water and a mangle and my grandfather had operate the mangle while my grand fed the clothes through and that was always done on a Monday well we had a twin tub I don't know if you remember the, the, the twin tubs of the time it was at Kenwood I think so I decided right I'd better do some big washing here uh, and the bedding was certainly getting needing for wash because when you work at the pit you can have a good scrub at work but it always gets trapped in your pores you see so you've got to regularly do the bedding. So I dragged out the twin tub and put my father's bedding in it. Um, now the thing is, when you've finished doing the washing, you've then got to do the drying in a in the spinner. And sometimes you could get a standalone spinner. But anyway, the spinner on the old twin tubs was a work of art. You had to load it proper so it was balanced. You see, um, and I didn't, never did. Never got the hang of it. So I've just got father's bedding in there and probably a few towels and what have you. And he set the spinner going. And, and the whole twin tub's going all over the kitchen like this. You're way trying to keep it down on the floor. And then if you just get another really uneven load, like maybe you've got yourself a, a dressing gown and a couple of old big bath towels in, boom, it's bouncing all over the place. It's where I learned to dance. Keeping the twin tub going around the kitchen, that's how I learned all the moves, you see. I'm lying. I was a, what you call a rocker back in the days and I just couldn't dance. All I did was sort of shake my head. <laughs> and said girlfriend, sadly, um, I took her to Manchester to buy some tickets to see Jethro Tull and she got dead ups, upset that a ticket wasn't for her. <laughs> but she was into Abra and Petula Clark. She wasn't gonna get Jethro Tull, but I made it up to her because of a dead romantic. A motorhead were on at King George's Hall in Blackburn and I took her. She didn't enjoy it. In fact, she said, 
You better not shake your head. So I went, I won't shake my head. Which is, you know, is a slow dance for a rocker, isn't it? So when he rode up, the cycle finally finished after a, a circuit or two of the kitchen and I got everything out and of course they're not really dry when you get them out the old twin tub spinners and I went and put father's washing up his, his duvet because duvets were the new thing then out on the washing line in the garden and I came in and looked and there on the duvet was the perfect outline in coal dust of my father it was the shroud of Goodshire and Yellowway and Ellen Smith were putting coaches on to bring pilgrims to see the Shroud of Goodshire Chapel. True story, 1983. Well, first some government safety advice on washing lines. Watch out for blackbirds. Well, look, another bridge. It's getting a bit of a reoccurring theme, this, isn't it? Yeah, we've had a sharp louse today because we're supposed to be learning all about linguistics and the Northeast dialect, Geordie and Durham and all that, but it hasn't worked out as I thought. But if you do learn something about linguistics, you might learn what a sharp louse is. Differences were in the Eden Valley now, as you can see by the lovely red sandstone on this bridge here at Lazenby. Now, washerwoman, it's a bit of a derogatory term, isn't it? it people look down on washerwomen or char ladies. Um, think back to Dickens' novel, A Christmas Carol, and the, the woman that did for him. And there, there she was selling all his bed clothes and everything round about. Uh, like I say, quite derogatory. Um, Wishy-washy. Was he in Aladdin? But anyway, it didn't always used to be so. Uh, if you go right back before like ancient Greece and what have you, it was quite respectable for a lady and a handmaidens to be washing. And perhaps washing down by a river here. But by the 1700s, it was looked down on like as a lady that took in washing. And actually, in Ireland, they had a thing that was called Magdalene washes, Magdalene laundries. Uh, actually, they were also called Magdalene asylums. And the first one appeared in this country in Whitechapel. I think it was in the 1770s. And they were run by the Protestant church. And the, basically, they were for so-called fallen women or ladies perhaps who'd uh, had children out of wedlock and hadn't got families to support her. So they went to these places that were nothing better than workhouses really. Uh, and they provided laundry services. So these ladies, these young lasses, worked as laundresses in appalling conditions. It, it was mad hot, it was stifling in there, long, long hours, and they didn't get paid. All they got was the meagre rations that they worked for. Um, and well, they treat, they treat them worse than they did in prison, to be honest with you, when you start looking into it. And the tradition kind of carried on. Sweden, America, Ireland, as I say. I think 1996, possibly the last one actually closed, believe it or not. Isn't it great how free countries actually treat their people? But the reason they were called Magdalene laundries, or Magdalene asylums, was after Mary Magdalene, who was supposedly a fallen prostitute who uh, reverted to Christianity, didn't she, and made good. That was the idea. So our story takes us back to Broadclough at Bacup, around about August 1869. And we get introduced to a lady who's 34 years of age, thereabouts, called Ruth Kelly, very famous name. And she's married to George, who was a clogger. And she was a washerwoman, or it looks as though she took in washing. Now the story also involves young Thomas Greenwood, aged eight, who also lived at Broadclough and his parents were Elizabeth and Charles Greenwood. And all we know about Charles was that he was a stoker and willow minder in one of the mills. Now Ruth was busy hanging out the washing. She had a washing line by the side of the Bake Up Burnley Road, up at Broadclough, strung between two stoops. And she also had a young one inside that she was trying to get to sleep. But as she was working and trying to get the young one to sleep and get the washing out, there was a gang of lads, a gang of kids, 10 years and younger, laking on her washing line. Basically, they were hanging over the line and swinging and just nattering and doing what young lads do, but making a bit of a racket, 
stopping the young and getting to sleep and generally getting on Ruth's nerves. So Ruth, once or twice, shouted, get out! You know what it's like, don't you, when you're a kid? Oi, you! Get away! But they ignored her. They said they never heard her. Now, it looks like the incident happened on a Wednesday night, about six o'clock-ish, so just after Magic Roundabout, if you will. Now, whether because of Ruth's shouting or because of another reason, most of the lads got off the washing line and they ran to Burnley Road because there was a velociped coming up the road and that was a fantastic sight to see in those days, so that captured their attention. But that left just three lads swinging on the washing line. There was Thomas, our hero, William Craven, and a 10-year-old lad called John Utley. They were left as Ruth again came out breathing fire. So John Utley and William Craven, they cottoned on to what was going on and they, and they ran away and they kept shouting for Thomas, get off, get off, come on, she's coming. But either Thomas didn't listen or he wasn't bothered. And he was still sort of hanging on the line, swinging. See, he was eight year old and the line came up as far as his belly. Anyway, Ruth came out of the kitchen again. This time she had a knife. No, she wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna do that, don't worry. But she came behind him and to the side. Now, whether she looked to see if he was still on the line or not, she claims that she didn't. But she went right up to the washing line, boom, cut it. So it slumped and Thomas fell backwards and he hit the back of his head against the stone. So Thomas managed to get home into the back kitchen where his mother is herself, she was doing some washing. Any road she saw all this blood coming out the back of his head, round about his neck. So she cut the hair to try and tend to the wound. But there wasn't a great deal she could do apart from wash it and, uh, and, and sort of dress it a little bit. And she, she was of the opinion that it would right itself. It was nothing too serious now that she got rid of the, uh, of the blood flow. But that wasn't the case. Because as the weeks went by, the wound didn't really heal that well. He was better in himself, but then after a couple of weeks, he started to get really poorly. Um, the, the wound was festering a little bit, um, and she thought for a start that perhaps he had scarlet fever coming on, so she took him to see the doctor. It was Dr. Williams, and there was very little he could actually do. Um, it certainly wasn't scarlet fever, and not, lo not long after that, he lost the use of his legs, did young Thomas. It was as though his legs wouldn't bear the weight of his body. And then he couldn't talk anymore. And sadly, after 10 weeks of being badly after the accident, he died. Now at the post-mortem, Dr. Williams obviously gave an examination and he found a lot of contusion round about the spinal column at the back of the back of the, the head there. In fact, he'd said just before he died, the scalp itself seemed to go really bad, like started to decay, you know? There was a lot of contusion and the membrane was in a bad way for about six inch down his back and there was also a softening of the base of his brain. And that's what the doctor put down, the fact that killed him, the softening of the brain tissue. But nevertheless, he died as a result of falling on that stone 10 weeks prior. So now, people thought maybe there was a murder to answer for. So the police were sent for, but in the meantime, Ruth and George Kelly had flitted, as we would say back at home, and they cleared off to Rochdale. So an inquest was called, and it was held at the Roe Book in Broadclough. And uh, Ruth, well, the police had been over to Rochdale and they'd sort of arrested her, if you know what I mean. And she had to appear at the inquest. Sadly, George didn't come with her, so Ruth was at the inquest with just her and a young child. And all the evidence was given and the, the coroner sort of said well to Ruth if, if you did have malicious intent and cut that rope you're guilty of murder but Ruth insisted that she hadn't and she hadn't seen anybody on the watching line at the time so as the coroner was summing up the case he said well murder isn't something really to consider but perhaps manslaughter is so the jury retired and it only took them 10 minutes to come back and say that Ruth had now to stand trial at the Assizes for manslaughter. But rather than remand her in custody, he released her on bail. 
So the assizes, it was quite interesting actually how the, um, the judge summed things up there. Because before the jury retired, and there's not a lot of uh, bump on the case actually, but he said to the jury, he said, well, if you think there was ill intent and she cut that line, malice aforethought, then uh, certainly there's a case to answer. But if you don't think that, then as they said in those days, there's no bill to answer to. And the jury came back, no bill to answer to. So Ruth didn't get charged with manslaughter, she was free to go. But sadly, I mean, the Greenwood family still had to live with the loss of a child, didn't they? Like I said, the um, Ruth and her husband had gone to live in Rochdale. Well, if you look them up on the 1871 census, they're both living up Edge Side, uh, and they've got three children at the time. So, blast back to 1869 and the uh, tale of a washerwoman. The maid was in the garden hanging out the clothes when down came a blackbird. And it pecked off her nose. 